Well, when I was 20 weeks pregnant, I had my normal 20 week ultrasound and they said, oh, the baby's kidneys are a little bright. So we're just going to refer you to a, a, a perinatologist. And so it was 25 or 26 weeks. It was March 1st. I remember that. Um, so we went for that appointment and uh, she, at that point, his he they told us his kidneys were really bright and offered us to go to another state to have an abortion because it was already too late in Minnesota. Um, they said he'd never lived to see a year. He may not see 30 days. And this was coming off of not seeing anything, anything. abnormal in previous ultrasounds. Pre yeah, nothing <laughs> unusual before this. Um, and well, we just said, well, then we'll hold our baby in our arms for 30 minutes then, if that's what it is. So, um, well, he's 16 now, so. <laughs> so he lived. Yeah. Um, and yeah. we were followed by a geneticist ever since he was born because of that ultrasound and then leading into his birth. And um, the other thing that they mm -hmm. found on the ultrasound, which they didn't tell us right away, but was that he had extra digits on his hands and feet. Um, but they told us already he has these enormously wide feet and that if we kept that extra toe, which was really just a whole nother, it's like if the pinky had another Another head pinky. Or, yeah, it, yeah. yeah it was, then it was like a full extra. Full extra digit. Digit right. that moved and everything um, on his toe. On his hand, it was just a little nubby that wasn't really attached it had a fingernail and a bone and everything in it but it wasn't movable moving on its own it I was always afraid of it, it was going to tear it off when I put a shirt on him or something when he was a baby but um but as he got oh the other thing too when he was a baby is he was he would cry all the time we could never figure it out make him happy we thought maybe the doctor said maybe he has GERD and so those uh that mitral um, valve in the esophagus to the stomach uh, doesn't form really until they're a few months old. And so acid easily um, comes up the esophagus. And so a lot of babies cry from that because uh, it hurts, it burns. And so we had him on medication for that and that didn't do anything. And we would just take him for drives so he'd fall asleep. And um, but it, now, in retrospect, we know he was just hungry all the time. Right. And you know, throughout those first few years, different things would keep cropping up. You know, we we spent I don't know days, weeks in children's hospital. Yeah. He would get RSV. His uh, lung would lung collapse, would collapse. <laughs> and then we would be there for a very long time. Another I, thing that cropped up yeah. was was his seizure. Was and twenty yes, months. when he was twenty months old, um, which I pretty much I I died. You for... died. Yes, he was pulseless, breathless, blue, mottled. Um, had such a severe seizure. Had to call nine one one. Yep. Um, and I was holding him, and he was dead, and I was screaming like some lunatic. Yes because my baby died and at one point Bill's talking to 911 and he asks me a question about if he was breathing and or and I and he says aren't you on like a code team or something at the hospital and then just like that I was like yes I am and then I like switched over from being a freaked out mom into healthcare professional and realized you know he's got all these secretions children's hearts don't stop beating unless they stop breathing. Um, so he, you go into cardiac arrest from respiratory arrest. So what's causing the respiratory arrest in a seizure? It's always the secretions. So I opened his mouth, swept out secretions, flipped them over onto his stomach, gave him some big wax on the back, flipped him back, started CPR, and then boom, he turned pink from blue and started crying. And well, we all were crying at that point. So. Right. So that happened. So then it just becomes, you know, as a parent, it's like, what's next, right? 
all these different things keep yeah. cropping up and I, something. I remember, you know, Everett doing T-ball and he, <laughs> you remember, remember doing T-ball? Yes, do I do. And so he's out in the outfield and, you know. Oh, he, was, he was at the pitcher. Well, yes, I was. I was at pitcher. You were the pitcher. Okay. That's right. But even though you're not pitching. Right. But you're in that position and right. kid hits the ball. It goes right to Everett's feet and the parents were all sitting along the fence and we're like, what is he blind? Yeah. And at that point, we didn't have a diagnosis. No idea that he was actually turns, going turns, blind. Turns out he was going <laughs> blind. So then you feel bad after. Yeah. But, um, but. Anyway, so um, just all these things, and uh, again, we were followed by geneticist ever since he, you know, in the utero even. Yeah. Um, and you know, the geneticist could not uh, put her finger on it. Um, she didn't really identify Everett as, I think BBS maybe had it, crossed, it, it crossed her mind. Because she's a geneticist who actually specializes in ophthalmic genetic disorders. So she said she thought about BBS, but immediately ruled it out because one, he was too cute. Um, <laughs> and two, which we've seen a lot of BBS people and many of them are very attractive. Uh, it's when you look it up in some of the photos from back in the right. early days, there are these very Old face. Yeah, because they, yeah. they still hadn't separated it from Lawrence Moon. Um, it was Lawrence Moon Barty Beetle syndrome. And so they had um anyway, some of the photos were not very nice. Right. Uh when you Googled it back then. And um, but and she had assumed that he had an overgrowth as part of his syndrome. And I said, well, couldn't it just be that he's going to be tall? I, I'm at the time I was 5'11 and a half. I shrunk right, to 5'11 right. now, but um, Everett's 6'2, over 6'2, and he's 16 years old. So, and then she's like, well, gosh, I never thought of that because Barty Beetle syndrome, um, if anything, has some. Um, hypogonadism and what is that uh means you don't hit puberty right away you're the the hormones that you need to hit puberty sometimes don't, don't produce and sometimes the reproductive organs are smaller and um but dr zador told us early on that mm -hmm. you would not have that problem so anyway, I mean, it's, it's, again, this BBS has so much variability within it, even a geneticist who is specializing in ophthalmic, opth ophthalmic, thank you, ophthalmic, <laughs> sorry, um, can identify it, right? So you can't, it's almost like you can't put BBS into a box because it is so variable. And yeah. he seems, ever since, he seems to have sort of this I don't want to say a mild case, but um, comparatively to to the group, um, you know, he doesn't have a lot of the same effects. But anyway, but the, some of the mm -hmm. others mm -hmm. he has in spades, you know, like right, like right. he has the epilepsy component, which many other people don't. In right. fact, uh, there aren't very right. many that have ep the epilepsy. Right. Um, he, but his. Well, yeah, just the IQ span. We we have BBS friends that have an IQ of 14. And we know of BBS people who've gone on to be, I mean, graduate. Master's. Master's degree level. What was my yeah. IQ after uh, taking uh, set? Yours was almost always the same. And they haven't been able to check it in a long time because so much of the IQ test is visual. But it was always around 70 so sort of low normal. Well, coming up to the diagnosis, though, um, the reason that that came about was oh, yes. actually uh, a vision check. I mean, at one point, I think he was five at the time, or maybe even he before. Was, he was four. He was four, and, and we're like, we should get his eyes checked. Miss Claire, yes. wait, wait. Your pre-K. Yeah, I remember teacher. her. She had mentioned that she thought she saw, she wasn't sure, but she thought she saw your right eye sort of drift off drift off once in a great while and I'm like gosh I've never noticed that and 
And then we were talking to your mom mm -hmm. and Oma. Oh, and, yeah, that's right. And she said she thought she noticed it, but didn't never said anything because she wasn't sure and didn't want to cause panic, make us worry about yet another thing. Um, and so I took him to a optometrist or ophthalmologist, actually. So, and he just looked in his eyes and said, oh, he's fine. We'll just patch him. And I thought, there's no way, not with everything else he has going on. So then I looked up um, ophthalmologists at the University of Minnesota and found one that specializes in multi-system disorders and took him to her. She scheduled an ERG, which he had to be sedated for. And she came out during the middle of it and said, told us, she said, you know, um, we're resetting the machine right now. We're checking it to make sure it's functioning properly, but it looks like it's supposed to have these big peaks and valleys and Everett's just sort of goes like this. To and the point where they wanted to reset the machine because their, they couldn't believe it was so low. Yeah. And right. so they did and they repeated it and it was the same. But she told us, she says, this is a very strong sign of um, retinitis pigmentosa. And she says, you may want to look and let your uh, geneticists know that because that might be the key to unlocking whatever genetic disorder he has. And it's exactly what it was. Um, and wasn't it later that day where the geneticist I, called you? Or? I called her and left a message and right. she called us back and it was on a Thursday. Well, she called me at work the next day mm -hmm. and started asking me questions like, does he have this? Yes. Does he have this? Yes. Does he have this? Yes. And it was like all these things that I thought were just little, I never thought were anything one of them being, you know, does he have an insatiable appetite? Insati <laughs> insatiably hungry. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes absolutely. 100%.